All right. Um, next thing to mention is the laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy. And this, as the name implies, is a combination of the, the two, vaginal and laparoscopic. And the name LAVH, or laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, really describes a number of different procedures. Um, anything from just taking down the most superior attachments of the uterus, like taking down the round ligaments and the uterine ovarian vessels, to working your way all the way down, taking out the uterine vasculature, potentially making the colpotomy, but then doing the final um, pedicles and extraction from below. So just because somebody says an LAVH, you don't know exactly what they're going to do. They may do some or all of it from above and then go below to complete it. And there's not a standardized definition at this point. And it provides some advantages. It gives you the visualization of the peritoneum as with a laparoscopic case, but also if you have the skill and experience to go and do a portion of the case vaginally, it may give you access to the vessels that you couldn't get uh, laparoscopically. Um, I've used this in, in some cases to do exactly that, where I've completed a laparoscopic case where I found the, the last couple of pedicles, taking the uterine vesicles, taking the uterosacral ligaments to be a little too difficult from above. And so I go below, make a colpotomy, take those last couple of pedicles, remove the uterus, and do the closure vaginally. Uh, we'll say a whole lot more about that, as, as you might expect. The complication rate is intermediate between that of the, the abdominal and the vaginal procedure. Um, and the best way to think about the LAVH is that if you can do it one way or the other, that's probably the best. But LAVH is still an alternative to an abdominal incision if you're trying to avoid that for uh, reasons of patient preference or recovery time. And then finally, let's talk about the robotically assisted. Um, some people are preferring to call this a microprocessor assisted hysterectomy. This is the newest technique. It, in many cases, may allow for a larger uterus to be removed without the necessity of a large abdominal incision. It also may have reduced pain and better cosmetic outcome than an abdominal hysterectomy. But again, like with the LAVH, the, the reason to do this is that it's an alternative to abdominal. It, in some cases of the large uterus, it gives you better access to the vessels and uh, might let you do a larger uterus than you do otherwise, but this shouldn't be considered as a first-line replacement for the total vaginal or total laparoscopic hysterectomy. It is expensive. The time requirement is greater for a robotic case on average. Now, certainly there are um, surgeons doing these that can do them faster than other surgeons can do laparoscopic or vaginal or abdominal cases, but on average. And then the other thing to consider is that thus far in the studies that we have, there's an increased risk of vaginal cuff dehiscence, meaning separation of the colpotomy suture line. Again, this is something that we'd expect to improve over time as individuals' skills, techniques, and better equipment for doing the specific procedure come about. Um, but as of right now, this uh, is still elevated over the risk of dehiscence at any other type of, of hysterectomy. All right, so that's a quick run through of all the different methods or routes of hysterectomy. We mentioned earlier the, the indications and the potential benefits of the hysterectomy being the improvement or cure of those diseases. There are significant risks or complications that we need to consider too. Um, most of these are intra-op. And it's the things you would think of. Bleeding. The uterine vessels um, have a lot of blood flow. The uterus is a well vascularized organ receiving
um, flow not only from its um, named vessels, but also collateral flow from the cervix, from the uterovarian uh, vessels. So it's getting blood flow from a number of different individual vessels, which also flow from different systems, the ovarian uh, branches coming off of the, um, the aorta, whereas the uterine vessels are coming off of the internal iliac. So you've got um, blood flow coming from a lot of different directions, and you can imagine that if you're not careful securing these vessels early on, then you can get bleeding. You can not only get bleeding from the vessel you're trying to ligate, but if you have ever seen a hysterectomy, particularly large fibroid uterus, there's often back bleeding from the uterus itself after a pedicle is taken. We take steps to try to minimize this using different things, but it, but it can be pretty um, considerable in some cases. The other intra-op injury that we, we worry a lot about is damage to other organ in the pelvis. And you think about it, the uterus has a lot of close neighbors in the pelvis. It's often or always touching the bladder. Um, the bladder is sometimes adhered to the front of the uterus based on previous surgery. The sigmoid colon and rectum are right there uh, lying in close proximity. They can be injured in the ureters. Those are probably the three most common things that are injured, uh, particularly uh, with laparoscopic cases that we have to consider. Things like the transverse colon and the small bowel can be injured. And those are less commonly injured than the other ones that I mentioned, but they are there. Intraoperatively, we also consider the risks of anesthesia, which are common to any, um, any surgical procedure. Then there are post-op complications as well, pain, DVT, wound complication, and this could be anything from a superficial cellulitis to uh, an actual dehiscence or separation of the wound, and the severity can, can vary. Now, the risk of the, these things obviously varies as do these on the individual patient characteristics and by technique, but overall the risk of most of these complications, if you look in large series, is somewhere between 1 and 3 percent of any of these things occurring. Slightly higher in some series, slightly lower, but if you took a, a, a median look at it, it would be about 1 to 3 percent overall. So the overall hysterectomy risk and complication rate is lower, um, or is low, and that's what makes it a, a reasonable approach to treat some of these diseases that we do treat. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the technique. Now, obviously, I can't describe in detail um, the technique for every route or type of hysterectomy. So what I want to do is just mention that there are some steps which are common to all routes of hysterectomy. And particularly from the student point of view, this is important because whether you're watching a laparoscopic or a vaginal case, we still have the same anatomic structures to deal with. We're just doing it in a different order. So as I go through the, the route or go through the technique, I'm going to describe it in the order that we will see it at a vaginal hysterectomy. For an abdominal case or a laparoscopic case, it's essentially reversed. So the initial incision for a vaginal hysterectomy hysterectomy is made around the cervix, whereas for the abdominal case it'll be made in the anterior abdominal wall, and this just depends on the route. In the vaginal case we would then move on to dissection and development of the vesicouterine space and the rectovaginal spaces. And what this does is provide some, some room to work. It allows us to make the colpotomy. It allows us to put some distance between the bladder and the uterus, as well as the ureters and the uterus as we go about the, the hysterectomy. In the vaginal hysterectomy, this is done immediately after the circumscribing incision around the, the cervix. Um, and it involves just uh, developing that potential space that's there. Furthermore, on the, the dissection of the spaces, there's the um, paravesical and pararectal spaces. These are potential spaces really and this 
this portion of the case is usually done in an abdominal or a laparoscopic case and it allows access to um, visualize the ureter from above and it also gives you better access to the uterine vessels. The colpotomy and this is incision in the vagina and entry to the peritoneum. Done early in a vaginal hysterectomy, done late in an abdominal or a lap laparoscopic uh, case. This can be done sharply, that's how it's usually done in a vaginal case, whereas um, at a laparoscopic case it might be used, uh, it might be done using an energy cutting sealing device. All right, so moving up from the colpotomy, we would then divide and ligate the uterosacral ligaments. Okay. Uterosacral, obviously connecting the uterus to the, the posterior pelvis. These provide a lot of support for the uterus and it's important that when these are ligated that we try to damage them as little as possible because this is how we can then go back later at the conclusion of the vaginal case and suspend our vaginal cuff to try to prevent uh, prolapse of the vaginal apex and formation of enteroseals. Moving up from the uterosacral ligaments, we have the cardinal ligaments. And the uterine vasculature. Now the, the cardinal ligaments aren't as readily visible in situ as they are in your textbook. Um, it really just refers to the peritoneal folds that are around the, the lower portion of the, the uterus and cervix. But the important thing here is that the uterine vasculature is carried within the cardinal ligaments. And these are cases um, where we take care to be cautious of the location of the ureter. If you remember the, the classic teaching in Anatomy of Water Under the Bridge, ureter often lies quite close within a few millimeters of the uterine vessels. So you'll notice when we do these cases, we spend a lot of time discussing the location of the ureter, um, looking for it, trying to dissect these spaces so that we can actually visualize it and avoid injury to the ureter during the case. As we move up, we continue to divide or separate the broad ligament folds. Usually in a vaginal hysterectomy, we're taking care to incorporate the anterior and posterior leaves of the broad ligament so that we trap any potential bleeding vessels. Uh, doing it from above, however, you might intentionally open the broad ligament, which gives you access to the retroperitoneal spaces and ability to visualize the uterine vessels in the ureter. But as we, we march up the uterus from the vaginal case, these are the longest series of clamps usually is dividing the the upper portion of these peritoneal folds. And remember that the cardinal and the broad ligament really um, are just different locations on the same peritoneal fold. You might have quite a lot of vasculature here as well. Particularly in the case of a fibroid uterus, you may find fairly large vessels in the broad ligament that um, are unique to that patient and her um, leiomyomata. 